I'm Lisa Billiou and I went from housewife to co-founder of the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. missions seem very possible compared to the dream today's Women of Impact had. What was the dream? To become the first hijabi news anchor in America. And after graduating from a top journalism school at just 20 years old, she set out to make this dream a reality. And a reality it became. Wearing her hijab like Superwoman wears her cape, she fought the naysayers and became America's first reporter to wear one on air. But her heroism didn't stop there. In 2016, she made history again, but this time it was for appearing in Playboy, but fully clothed with her headscarf. Their article, Renegades, featured cultural wall breakers that were changing the way we think and dress. She has also been featured in Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, GQ and Forbes, and her efforts on the docuseries Sold in America, Inside Our Nation's Sex Trade, garnered over a million downloads in just a few short weeks. But her mission to change and impact the sex trade industry didn't stop there. Her Norafex streetwear line is dedicated to advancing anti-sex trafficking efforts. And the Norafex movement is dedicated to reclaiming the power of women. So guys, please help me in welcoming the woman who as a child was too embarrassed to admit she knew Arabic, to becoming a badass, trailblazing journalist, speaker, author, vlogger, host, fashion designer, philanthropist and producer. And yes, all while wearing her hijab. The one and only Noor Tagori. Oh, welcome, my dear. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm and, so excited oh to my, be here. I'm so excited to have you. That was you. a really kind intro. What you've done is so incredible. Thank and you. And I really want to start from the moment when you were younger and you wanted to dye your hair blonde and have the contact. And I did. And you did. <laughs> did you wear the blue contacts? I did. <laughs> because for like a year. For a year? For a okay, year. Okay, so talk to me about identity and yeah. how you felt and then that transition. So it really started from a very young age. I grew up in a very conservative white town. My first day of school, I walked into class and I sat down next to the only other girl who had dark brown hair. And I asked her if she was Muslim because I'd never seen another girl with dark brown hair. And I just realized without understanding like what my differences were, I just realized I wasn't like the rest of the kids in my class. I didn't look like them. My mom didn't look like them. Um, and because of like the reactions to the differences, I remember just feeling like I wanted to curl up into a ball and just not let anybody ever see who I actually was. And I, in turn, did a disservice to myself and didn't let, any, didn't let myself understand who that was. So I struggled with that a lot. Um, and it was definitely like a strong matter of the people I was surrounded by and the community I was surrounded by. Like my parents were very encouraging and loving parents. Like my mom was a guidance counselor. So she always like knew what I was struggling with, but as many times as she could tell me, like I was amazing. I was great. I was doing all of these things. I still had, um, a sense of doubt because I just was like, but I'm not like everybody else. Um, and it, and I struggled with that until we moved out of that area um, we moved right outside of Washington, D.C., and I experienced my own sense of culture shock. There was so much diversity where I was living, and I was almost jealous of how confident everybody was in their own skin. And I wanted to know what that would look like for myself, so I started making a promise to myself that I was going to do anything and everything that felt true to me. And the second that I started doing that, like an in poor, like just opportunity and uh, like self-validation and understanding of who I was just became a reality for me and I realized wow like I should have done this a lot sooner. But how do you actually do that then? So you've seen the diversity like okay maybe this is something I need to adopt really accept who I am. What does that first step look like? Because if you've spent your whole childhood trying to be someone you're totally. not and you, you see it externally like oh okay other people are owning it. What is that first step, though, for yourself? And I'm sure you must have been like, were you shit scared? I think I was naive. Okay. I think I was more naive than scared. Everybody else around you is just as insecure as you are, if not more. Like, everybody has insecurities. Everybody has self-doubts. And I realized that the people that maybe were picking on me at school or seemed so confident were masking a lot of other things. Because 
their negativity or animosity or the way that they would treat other people was a reflection of what they were dealing with on the inside. But it was like, wait a minute, if everybody else is insecure and is dealing with stuff, and I'm not talking about like everybody else just in high school, I'm talking about every mentor you have, every adult that you look up to, like everybody has something. And once you realize that, you're like, wait, if I just own up to mine and acknowledge mine and stay strong and true to myself, no one can take that away from me. And I realized like, if I wanted to be who I wanted to be and I was going to chase after this dream of mine, no one except for myself could stop me. And every time somebody said no, they just weren't the right person. They just couldn't see my vision. Like what I knew was so true to me, no one could take away. And once you realize that like everybody has something and most people are never thinking about you and they're not thinking about your insecurities and once they put you down or once they bully you or once they whatever, they're moving on, you're not stuck in their mind, you realize like, wait a minute, why am I letting people's energy take up space in my brain and in my own energy? Why not just channel all of that into focusing on myself so that I can be a better person or a better community member or a better, uh, better contributor to this world and become stronger in that? And even when you are struggling with insecurity and even when you're struggling with self-doubt, when you carry yourself like higher with a higher head and you um, just stand taller and you are firm in what you have to say like nobody sees through that strength of yours because you put it on like one thing that um, I've been referring we just talked about our love for Wonder Woman before this yeah. but one thing like my husband told me about earlier this year that I've kept trying to do before any like speeches or any meetings or whatever is is the superwoman pose and just putting your hands on your hips and standing really tall and just maintaining that for 15 seconds and realizing oh wait I am this strong like I am this tall I am this great and walking in with this energy of of, of respecting yourself and loving yourself and understanding that you deserve everything that you're going after I love that so much. As you just did the pose, I had like little music playing in my head. And I was like, that should be like an app or something where you can like press it and be like, dun 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 dun. Just that. Yeah. Just like a one. Right? Yeah, look at your, your business mind. <laughs> I can't help it. You just did the pose and it just started playing. That's genius. I love it. Um, okay, so you've made this one change. Um, then how did you take it to then having the strength and confidence to wear the hijab? What was that first step like? Because you were um, working at a news station, correct? And you had news anchors, they were saying like, oh, she'd never get a job. Oh, yeah. Wearing that. So I put on the hijab when I was 16. Um, and it was just amidst this like identity crisis. Like no one in my family thought I was going to keep it on. You can't be on TV with it on. And that's the one thing that I knew I wanted to do since I was a kid. So when I did put it on, I was like, maybe this is going to give me the same strength that I see like in my mom and my sister and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Like maybe this is like the thing that I need that's going to make me feel stronger. And so I put it on and right after I put it on, I ended up getting a job offer at a newspaper. And I was like, wait, maybe I can still do this, like accomplish, accomplish this dream while wearing it. So I started college at 16 and I made a promise on my first day of school that I would uh, do any and everything that felt true to me. Like I wanted to make sure that I was joining every club, I was doing every activity, and eventually every single step that I took to stay true to myself led me to jobs in radio and then jobs in television. Um, and I eventually like got my first job at a local television station simply from like maintaining this sense of identity and strength and storytelling. And I also realized that I would have to be the absolute best journalist possible so that people wouldn't just shoo me away when I applied. And I had, I found mentors who wanted to train me to literally be so good at my skills that no one could ever say no to me. And part of me has to give credit to the fact that like, because I put on the hijab, I made sure I like maximized all my potential because there's a chance that if I never put it on that I would have been like, oh, I can just be like a good journalist and I'll still get a job and I wouldn't have ha like felt like the mm. fire to work so hard. And so the second you own your 100% like version of yourself, whatever is true to yourself, and you realize that maybe that doesn't fit in with society's typical standards, especially when it comes to television because everybody's cookie cutter looks the same. When it comes to news reporting, you have to ha carry your 
have certain outfits, certain no jewelry, certain hairstyles, whatever it is. So if you are different in any way, you have to be really good at what you do for people to make sure that they're not too terrified of you. And luckily we're in a time right now where like, like diversity is celebrated, inclusion is celebrated, and we've recognized there are strengths. But I don't think that we've recognized the strengths far enough where it's not just like, oh, we have to fill in our diversity quota and we have to make sure that we have different looking people instead of seeing, hey, actually, if we have diversity on our team and in our newsrooms, we will be better reporters, we will be better uh, community service members, we will be better people in general and will grow stronger. And I think people fear what they don't know a lot of times and therefore you stifle your community's growth. And so once you see past that, you realize, oh wait, there are some really incredible people who I can learn from. And you should always be in a room filled with people where you can learn from because that's the only way you're going to grow as a company, as a newsroom, as a brand and whatever it is. Um, because you have to be exposed to those perspectives, those ways of thoughts, those backgrounds, those stories. And so once I, and I think that this dream that I had was only possible now because of what we were doing today and where we are today. Like my, I like was shadowing a journalist at a local station and I sat at the anchor desk, she took a picture and I posted it on Facebook. I said, this is what my dream looks like. And the photo went viral. And because the photo went viral, I got access to mentors. I had like people reaching out to me with support. I had um, people asking for interviews. I had people asking me to speak. And, and I had access to like a global community filled with people who wanted the same for themselves and their communities. And so it really was a timing thing because even then I had people who were reaching out to me saying, hey, like, I just want you to know, like, this isn't going to happen. Like, it's always the hijab or the job. Like, I've tried this. I've tried this. It doesn't work. You either become a producer or you have to take off your scarf. And I was like, you know what? Like, thank you. But I really think that this is, there's like, a, this is time. It's time for this. And I always try to like make sure I remember to give credit to all of the people who were clawing at the door, who were banging at the door, who were sitting here and, and, and fighting for this. So that when I got to the door, I could just push in and walk through. And it wasn't always so easy, but it was never impossible. I never, ever, ever thought like, there's no way I could do this. My parents growing up, always encouraged me in becoming a storyteller and a journalist like my dad would put me in front of the news and try to like have intellectual conversations with me as a kid my mom would drive me to camps and internships and they would always tell me I was going to be a great journalist before I even knew what that term meant and this is something I've just recently reflected on but they're the only two people growing up where you know like I knew that they would never lie to me and so if my mom was going to tell me I was going to be bigger than Oprah one day I could never be like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. But if this like older white guy was telling me I'm never going to be on television because of what I'm going to wear, I'm just going to, I'm just going to think like, well, how, why would I trust you? Mm -hmm. You don't know me. You don't know where I've come from. You don't know my skill. You know nothing about me and you're making this assumption. I'm going to sit here and believe the people that I trust more than anything. And maybe that was a very naive like way of thinking, but it holds true to me today because I think that the confidence that I had and the drive that I had was built from like, the surrounding myself with people who are like, oh, 100%, you got this, anything you want. I love that so much um, because using people in your life like your parents can be very powerful. I know you've spoken very openly about Oprah and how much she's had an effect on you, um, same with me. Um, but what if someone doesn't necessarily have someone like that in their life? Yeah. And they've got a dream like you did. I want to be the first, you know, I want to be a news anchor. Like you said, I wanted that ever since I was a kid. So they've got their dream. They know what they want. And on the flip side, they want to be authentic uh, with their identity, but they come into direct collision, right? Which basically you found came into collision. You're like, well, I'd rather wear it and be authentic and fight my way to the top because you've had these people in your head, but what about the people that haven't? What could you, what advice could you give those people to not listen to the naysayers mm. and really still stay authentic? How do you break those mm. stereotypes, those not, those, um, the notion of you can't have both? You can't have both. I think that right now we're living in a time where we have access most a lot of people have access to the internet if you're watching this right now you have access to the internet and it is 
a scary place to be, of course, because there is a lot of negativity, but it's also a really beautiful place. Like I got to connect with people all over the world who were able to be part of my support system. Mm. Um, so I would say, one, you never need like great mentors or parents or friends to be the greatest off the bat. But you do get to collect people along the way. I don't think that anybody can get to the the where they want to be without community and without supporting mm-hmm. somebody else and having other people support you. Like we, as human beings, like grow as a community if we want to grow the right way. And so um, I would say quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. So if you can find one person that you feel like brings you positivity and encouragement, then that's better than having 10 people who might be passive aggressive and naysayers and whatever. But also more than anything, remember to listen to your gut and your intuition. That's the one thing at the end of the day, parents aside, family aside, friends aside, mentors aside, my gut is the one thing that like I've been able to hold on to and it's just like, oh, you never let me down. Like I always say, I think everybody is familiar with their dreams and, and their legacy at a very young age. We were talking about you being an artist, and, I'm, I, and I hope you don't mind me bringing this <laughs> up, but like you having teachers stifle you, and so therefore you never studied art. And now, all of these years later, you have these incredible drawings up, and you're an incredibly talented artist. Like You knew what was true to you from a very young age. A lot of people know what's true. You know what's good. And I always say in order to find your purpose, what I like to do is combine my skills and talents with the things that pain me. And so Mm. find causes that pain you. So the causes that pain me are violence against women, um, homelessness, uh, uh, the misrepresentation of communities in the media because I've seen how that directly harms me and my community. Mm. Those are the things that pain me. So what am I going to do? I'm going to combine my skills of storytelling and having a platform and being able to have connections and and build that into those causes. And then you find something to live for, like you find your purpose. So if you're able to at least be able to recognize what it is that pains you, like really reflect on it. What are the things that really bother you? Because everybody wants to save the entire world. And then when you try to get to that point, you're like, oh my God, this is so overwhelming. There's, I I don't even know where to start. I'm just going to give up right away. It is not our responsibility as a single human being to change the entire world. But what you can do is you can build. You can find the things that you want to work on and you want to contribute to, and then you can find your people. And then you can continuously build and chip away at things. And it's not supposed to be something that like happens overnight. I know this sounds really morbid, but one thing that always gives me peace is knowing we're all going to die. Yeah, I'm the same. Right? I love how you preface it, though, because some people are like that. Oh, that's so so morbid. But why is it morbid if you know that all of this is going to go away? Like, that's the one guaranteed thing we have. (laughs) We are all going to be gone. Then why not live every single day towards a purpose? Every single day towards something that makes you feel like that this world is worth living for. And, and to me, I've always found that to be in service. Mm -hmm. Like I've always felt comfort and hope and purpose in serving other people. And service doesn't always have to be volunteering. Service can be Mm -hmm. using those skills and talents to live for certain causes and serve the people affected by those causes, including yourself. So there are always ways for you to like find that center, find your North star and your alignment and also be able to create your own community. Like sometimes it's really scary. You, it's so easy to feel alone. And most Mm. of us feel alone. I've had times where I have felt alone in spaces filled with 600 people. There's one story that I share in a lot of my talks um, that recently happened. And I, I was speaking at a school in South Dakota And I was so nervous because I was told, like, you know, there had been some white supremacy issues and that's why they brought me out to speak. They wanted um, to have somebody who might be able to, like, ease the tension and stuff. And I was terrified. I was so nervous. I was told it was going to be, like, 200 students. And I called my mom crying. And my mom's freaking out. She's like, why are you making me nervous? What's going on? And I was like, I don't know. Like, just something's not right. And the girl who organized the event comes in and she's like, oh my gosh, 
we were expecting like 200 people, 600 people showed up. And so I'm actually really nervous and terrified because I'm like, is it 600 people who hate me? Right. Right. And so I went out on stage and um, I remember like there were people just kind of like sitting there like this, like really skeptical and like didn't know what to expect. And, uh, and it was, everyone was white, I think with the exception of like a couple of people that I could barely see. And so I started giving my speech and there was a story that I kind of like started tearing up that I brushed it off as if I was like tearing up because it was an emotional story, but I was really tearing up because I was really scared. Wow. And I stopped in the middle of my speech and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do an activity. And so I had people pass, I had people pass out index cards and they wrote with a pen, like a statement that said, if you really knew me, you would know blank. So I had everybody write on these cards. Like, if you really knew me, you would know whatever. And I decided to like just end my speech with reading off these cards. And so I started reading them. And probably nine out of 10 of them were about loneliness. If you really knew me, you would know I collect stuffed animals, so I feel less alone. If you really knew me, you would know that I'm, I feel lonely at all times and like there's nothing worth living for. If you really knew me, you would know this and that. And I remember just feeling an overwhelming sense of sadness and shame because I was like, wow, I judged all of these people before I came out here and they were all feeling the same thing I was feeling. It was a group of like 600 people that never in a million years that I think I was ever going to relate to and I felt just as lonely as they did while we were on stage. Wow. Yeah. Oh my God, that's so freaking powerful. It's, it, it was one of the most, it was something that like, I think about it all the time, which is why like whenever I walk into a room or whenever I uh, am engaging with people online and stuff like, I'm just like, you never know what people are going yeah. through. You just absolutely never know what people are going through. And at the end of the day, if you really want to try to find that common ground and that commonality with somebody, you can. Like there's always people out there who are going through things that might not be 110% exactly as you're going through, but they're feeling the exact same things you're mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to recognize like in the deepest, darkest moments of your life that you're not alone. That like there is something greater for you out there. I, the souls in America literally stemmed from an experience, my own experience of sexual violence. Like one of the darkest things that I ever had to go through was something that like I never thought I was going to come out and like talk about or do anything about, but I channeled that sadness and that anger and that darkness into my work, into something productive, into something of service to other people. And so the advice that I would give to a person who like doesn't know what to do with their dreams or doesn't mm. have the support system is to just channel into that, like find out what it is that you live for, what that purpose is. And, and every single day, make the intention of working towards that. And the second you put out that intention, the second you put out that energy, it always falls into place. And it doesn't fall into place by you just waiting around for it. You have to be proactive. But once you at least have that defining thing, go out and reach out to thousands of people. Like I reached out to thousands of journalists to shadow them and got a handful. And that changed my life. So find those people and be proactive and don't sit and feel sorry for yourself and make yourself and put yourself down and make yourself feel bad because that is precious minutes of your day and of your life in turn that you're wasting on not being able to channel whatever it is that you're feeling into something positive and productive. And at times it might not seem like it's possible, but the, like, as much as you chip away at it, at it, it will be there. And oftentimes other people can see in you what you can't see in yourself. And I still have that until now. Like I, that's why sometimes like I'm, I get like nervous or shy when people are saying things about me or reading off my bio. Cause I'm just like, what is it that people see in me that sometimes maybe I don't see in myself. So just know that those are just phases. Mm. At least you have something you're living for. Yeah. That's amazing. Cause I know that you've actually had to do that yourself, right? So when you were 12, I believe you had an incident in an elevator. Yeah. Um, 
and if you wouldn't mind taking us through that, but at the end, you have said that you initially started to feel shame. Like, was it my fault? Yeah. Um, you felt guilty for telling people about it. Um, so if you can tell me, uh, talk to us about the story, but then how you shifted that mindset from going from shame and guilt to then doing exactly what you said, which is like chip away at the confidence, chip or towards confidence. Um, how do you do that? And what, what did that so look like? So the story that, the, that I started off, like the, podcast with was about my first instance of sexual violence when I was 12 and it was in an elevator with a stranger and I didn't it was one of those things where like my parents growing up was like were like if anybody ever touches you just kick scream push Mm -hmm. whatever and they would say that to me like every day and I never thought anything of it and because they would say it to me every day when this happened I kicked screamed and pushed like my body reacted I didn't even know what I was doing and I It was a a very traumatizing incident because we ended up getting like the person arrested and everything like was taken care of, which a lot of times people don't get any sense of justice after that. Mm. But I had all this guilt and shame like, oh, did I hurt somebody or did I did I get somebody in trouble? And that that story that I shared was like the first like I'd had I've had other instances of sexual violence. And those were things that like I never realized what was happening until years later Mm. and so because I knew what that pain was on a level when I first heard about trafficking I was like wait a minute there's something this horrific that people can go through if I feel this way about my stories how how could I ever comprehend anything any of these people are going through like I physically could not fathom it and so I like dedicated myself to that cause. I was like, this is what I want to work towards. I don't know how. So in college, I started writing papers about it. Um, and when I first got my like jobs and news, I started reporting on it. And then finally, when I was given the opportunity to do documentary and a podcast documentary, I went after it and I finally matured into like understanding how to cover this. And to be honest mm-hmm. with you, Throughout the process of covering it, like recently in the last couple of years was when I started really processing and realizing what had happened Mm -hmm. to me. So it's almost like using your purpose and your journey towards these causes as a way to heal too. Yeah. And that's really what it is, is like using your victim story and turning it into your hero story. And how do you do that? Because I think so many people get stuck in the victim. Because here's the thing with situations like this, you have every right to be the victim. Right. So, but it doesn't serve you. So how do you get out of it? Or how do you like, as you know, let's say there's a 16 year old watching right now and they're, they're feeling broken and they feeling like the victim. How do you use it to empower you and switch yeah. it? I think the first thing I would say is finding somebody that you trust to talk to about Mm. it because the longer you sit with all of this, the more it eats you up and on the inside. No one deserves to hold on to that alone. No one does. Majority of the people that I've like that I know who are women have gone through an instance of sexual violence. And now more than ever, we know like it's not something that you have to be alone in because so many of us have gone through it. From my own experience, it's just like taking it, like using that as a way to one, connect with people who have gone through the same experiences. If you, if that's something that you're able to do and two, Mm. channel whatever you've gone through into whatever it is that you want to accomplish. Mm. Like I, I would never have been able to tell the story the way that I did had I not gone through what I went through. So whenever I think about it or whenever I know that I've gone through it and I get angry at the people who may have hurt me, I'm just like, yeah, but you guys have no idea what you like, how this made me. Mm. And, uh, and I, and when you do that, you never give them the strength. You never give the person who hurt you the power. You take it back and you take it back and you come back stronger. Mm. What do you think about the power of belief and like believing in yourself? I think we have, we hold that power. I think you choose to use it or you don't, um, and part of why people don't is because you're surrounded by negativity or people who are saying things to you. I think that as long as you remain strong in that, you know who you are, you know your intentions. Like that's one thing I'll never do is judge people on their intentions because I've had so many times people judge me on the intent. Like, 
oh, you did this because of this. You did this because of this. And I'm like, but how would you know that? Like, you did not cut up, open my chest and take out my heart and read it. Like, right. you you don't know. And and I think that we do such disservices to people when we judge people based on intention. And you saying intentions that we believe they're, what their intentions were yeah, versus absolutely. their real intentions. Absolutely. And so I have eliminated so much like negativity towards just being like, hey, I don't know what they even intended by that or like mm-hmm. where that was coming from because I know how hurtful that could be to me. But I also know who I am. I know what my intentions are. I know what my purpose is and I know how I choose to live my life. And so maintaining that sense of belief in myself is critical because I then don't feel bad when other people try to tear me down because I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't know me or my intentions or my purpose or what I'm doing. You don't know what happens behind closed doors. You don't know how I like what good I do. And I know I'm freaking great. So like I will never give that power away to anybody else. As long as you maintain that strength with yourself, like you can never give that to somebody else. Because how precious is that? Like maintaining that sense of self is so precious. And it's so fundamental to whatever it is that you want to do. Don't ever give that to somebody else. Don't ever let anybody else's words be the things that tear you down. I'm just in a way where I'm like, I'm really sad that you decided to assume that about me. But that's too bad. Bye. Maybe I'm going to block you if you use a lot of curse words. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. The reason why I ask is because like in looking into all the incredible things you've done, I really see like a common theme of the power of belief in yourself of what or what you're actually working towards. So, um, you know, I, I think you heard Oprah speak and you're like, well, if she can do it, why can't I? And it's that I belief, so. I think, that has allowed you to push when you get naysay, which mm-hmm. you have people that say you shouldn't wear this or you shouldn't do that. Um, and then there was, you did an interview on um, Paris television where you oh, spoke yeah. out. And then like the next day, <laughs> yeah. um, all these fans, even people that weren't Muslim, um, yeah. that don't wear headscarves, like, they all came up to you. And it was such a beautiful demonstration of your power of belief being passed on to others, even if it isn't the same belief. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so one thing that, one thing that's even stronger than I believe my belief in myself and in ourselves, like our belief in our, ourselves right. is the belief in something that's greater than you. So I might call that God, you might call it something different, but knowing that there is something that is greater than you. So in Islam, we have a word called tawakkul, which means like full and utter trust in How'd God. How do you pronounce it? Tawakkul. And my mom from a very young age always instilled that in me. When I didn't get a job, um, like have to work with, make sure you have to work with. There was one time that I like didn't get an internship that was pretty much guaranteed at CNN and I cried because I was so upset. But then the week after that, I got my first job as a television reporter. And like never again did I doubt that. But I also recognize that I'm not like the greatest power in the universe, that I am simply a human being who has good intention and has this strong sense of purpose. And I'm constantly going to work towards what I want. But I'm going to surrender myself to something bigger than me Mm -hmm. because I don't know what's best for me. I can sit there and apply a hundred times to the same job and never get it and be like, no, but I know this is what's best Mm -hmm. for me. And the second that I let go of that and I say, you know what? Maybe it isn't what's best for me. Maybe there's something better. Everything pours through. It's like, just let go of it and trust for a second that there's something bigger out here that's looking out for you because there is Mm -hmm and work towards your purpose but don't be like don't put blinders on and be opposed to everything else working itself out because every single opportunity that i've ever had was one that i never expected Mm -hmm. every single job every single incredible friendship that i've had every single like huge event that i've none of that was expected and then i have like this overwhelming sense of happiness like if i died tomorrow i would be like so at peace and happy with the way that I've lived my life because I've lived it in in service and in purpose, Mm. not in this assumption that I know what's best for me and that I'm going to go after all of this and that like I am entitled and deserve the things that I've set out for in a way where like I don't leave space for just the universe to let its thing just happen. Right. And do you believe in speaking about that in public, it really has had that knock on effect? Because after the interview, didn't you say like, what just happened? Like, what yeah. did I just do? What did I, I, yeah, I had no idea. I was getting my makeup done in the, in the room, the makeup room or whatever. And I tweeted like, hey, if you are 
in a French speaking country tune into this show or whatever, I'm going to go on. And then um, somebody came in and told me I had to delete that tweet because they had never had a Muslim woman with hijab on television. And if um, like the heads found out, they'd pull the plug on the interview. And I was like, wait, what? I have no idea what I'm going into. And I went in and I did this interview. And at the end of the day, my premise was, I don't care if people walk out completely naked or in a hijab, like the government shouldn't be telling people what to wear. That was it. It was pretty simple. And then I remember going on Twitter and there was just like floodgates just open. Like I had never gotten that many tweets. And then whenever we went out, we went to Versailles and everyone was stopping me and taking pictures. And I was like, why was this such a big deal? Mm. And somebody was like, because no one has ever had the courage to say this on television here. And it was like one of those things where maybe being naive was a great thing because I didn't know what it, like how big of a deal it was. And to be honest, I was in Paris speaking. Um, so that night I had a talk and I scrapped my entire speech after what happened and I just went through my old emails and I pulled out all of the emails of girls in France who had reached out to me saying, hey, I wear hijab and I want to be a journalist. I'm thinking about moving to Canada because I, I'm not allowed to get a job mm. here and like leave their family and learn a new language. And, and all of the, and I, and I thought to myself, I was like, one, this is a shame. You're, you're ruining your community by, by pushing out all this great potential. Mm -hmm. And two, like, I don't even know if I loved this so much that I would have the courage to leave everything that I knew to go pursue it. Interesting. Like, so that's the question. Would you like right now? I don't, if you at this, like what I have had the courage to leave my family yeah. and learn a new language to go to a different country to pursue journalism? Probably not. In a way, I almost felt like that was my fight here. I never I thought I had that. to leave, but I did think like, I don't feel welcome in this space and I'm not going to let that be okay. But I love that it's like fight or flight and you're like, hell no, hell no, I'm fighting. Yeah. Which oh, most yeah. people don't. Yeah, I think that there's courage in both. I think that there's courage in staying and fighting. And I think there's courage for the, all of the women who are like, I'm going to leave and do this because this is so important to me. And they have a way stronger, like they have a way bigger fight in France when it comes to the hijab mm. because people can't wear it. It's illegal to wear in, on, in like government buildings and schools, oh, on universities. Is it really illegal? Yeah. No, yeah, you can't wear it. Like moms can't chaperone their kids' field trips. Wow. Yeah. Like I'm, I still recognize, like I'm very blessed that I was able to do what I, what I did even though it was hard. Like I am doing a lot of writing right now and one of the things that I reflected on was that all of the things that I did along this journey that were so difficult that people never saw, I would do again. And I would never, now, like in that moment, I never saw it as a struggle because I so badly wanted mm. this thing that I was after that every time I worked an overnight shift and took extra jobs and saved money and got rejected and every single time those things happened or I got screwed over by a job or a person or whatever it was, like now looking back, I'm like, wow, that was, that was a lot. But at the time I was like, no, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And I never registered what was going on because I so badly focused mm -hmm. on maintaining this journey and getting to somewhere with it. And how important do you think that is for other people then? to like really have a purpose that is so strong that nothing else matters. I think that having a sense of purpose that's so strong is incredibly important because it, because it's always there. There's always potential mm. for that to be there. And therefore like you're living for that. Like that's what's incredible is living for something you care so much about. I don't think that everybody has to have a dream that seems unattainable or that you have to, you always have to aim to be like the CEO of a company or start the a start a company or be super famous or be super right. rich. Like the world doesn't work that way. I think that as long as you have a purpose and a mission and you're serving that and you're doing whatever it is towards that, that that in itself is great. Find your purpose, but it, but even if you don't feel like you have a concrete dream that you want to work towards right now, mm -hmm. go support somebody else's dream that shares a similar purpose like because that's just as great because they're not going to get anywhere with that either right. without um having support like that and i don't think we talk about that enough i think a lot of people are like go 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 be be the best be the top be the ceo be the the brain behind everything and like don't give as much value to the people who are making that happen 
because they're they're just as valuable like pieces in this whole puzzle. And so you never have to feel so so much pressure towards like making sure you get to like a specific spot. Mm. Just get to a specific purpose and then work your way towards whatever it is. Yeah, I always say it's about the journey, right? Because that's you, exactly what I say. Because you may not ever get to that end goal. But there also is never. There shouldn't be an end goal. Like, yeah, you're right. Because then what happens when you get to the end goal? Then you're like, um, so yeah. what's after this? Oh, I move I the goalpost. Exactly. You always have to move the goalpost. That's why I'm like, I don't have an end goal. And this is the most important part. And continuously like moving along the lines of this journey, and then I'm good. Yeah. Because I always think like your your end goal may not ever come. Or you may fail at it, or you may end up hating it. And so, if your journey sucks and you get to the end, let's say you do, and it's terrible, then you've just spent so much of your life doing something you actually don't enjoy. Yeah. Whereas, as long as if you enjoy the path to there, then it ends up being worth it, even if you fail at the end. Exactly. You will never attain anything without falling continuously, and that's okay because you get stronger as you continuously go. Like that, my like, but but don't stop. Don't ever stop and turn away from what you know feels true to you,、mm-hmm. because then you're hurting yourself. Yeah. Like just like that man who was digging and digging, and there was like that pot of gold at the end, and he was this close, and he turned around. Like you never know what you're turning away from, but also like as long as you're living towards whatever it is that feels true to you, you'll always be good. Yeah, I think perspective is everything. I think it's Tony Robbins that said,、um, "How do you make the worst day the best, you know, day of your life?" And so, going back to failure, I do the same thing now. I used to, when I would fail, like I would beat myself up, like "You're terrible. You see, you knew you couldn't do it, and you know, it's just proof that you're not good enough." And then hearing the Tony Robbins quote, I was like, "Okay, well, every time I fail now, I'm gonna switch it." And when I fail now, I'm just like, "Yes, you just learned a lesson, and you got so much stronger because you." You've just failed, and it's all perspective. It's the, always perspective. The fail is the same.、Yeah. That's so true, and it, it, it and it is something like the only thing you never really lose anything from failing. Like maybe time, sometimes a little bit of money and stuff, but maybe dent your you, ego as well. Yeah, but like if you're still like the you struggle with your ego, yeah. yeah, that's something that like let's talk about really, it. In fact, oh <laughs> yeah, let's go down the ego rabbit hole. I think the ego. I think like when you don't keep your ego in check, a lot of times it weaken, like it blurs your vision.、Mm-hmm. Like you need to be humbled sometimes for you to to see clear.、Um, and if you if you listen to that voice or that ego that like feels bruised or feels entitled or feels whatever, and it's like always a struggle,、um, then you just end up like focus, like your intentions aren't clear with what it is that you're doing, because then you're More focused on yourself than you are on the the cause or the purpose or the other people.、Um, I always say like the message is always bigger than me.、Mm. So、yeah. how do you not listen to the voice though? Because、um, it's I assume it's still there. I try to talk everything out with people so that I don't get alone with those thoughts, and then I try to be reflective of them. I talk to people who like will humble me and like make me realize that like I need to calm down and stuff. Um, I think that's part of why, like, my husband and I get along really well. Because as angry as I am about certain things, like, I'm just like, I can't believe so and so did that. Like, he'll still be like, yeah, but they were right in this, this, and this, or they、mm. did this, this, and this, or he'll always like put perspective in like a very real light, and you learn from that, and you recognize like, oh wait, like this is where I messed up, or this is what I could have done better, and ma- And as you go, like you make less of those mistakes because your ego is in check and you, your your intention is constantly to do right by other people.、Mm-hmm. And do you think habit also helps? Like, okay, well, if you've been down that before, if you've experienced it and you've got over it, then maybe the next time you can use those habits、yeah. that you've adopted. Oh, one hundred percent. I think that like habit helps because you because it's how you've rewired your brain. A big part of dealing with ego is also dealing with like the lack of gratitude. So, because you're, you, you end up being blind to all the blessings that are around you, and then you focus on, like you focus and then you fester with the negativity.、Mm-hmm. Um, I always say, like, if you can, if you're in a rut, one thing I advise is like writing three things that you're grateful for every single day, and they're like three different things that you're grateful for every day. Because once you do that for like a couple of weeks, you're physically rewiring your brain to just constantly notice good and gratitude,、uh, good. In everything,、mm-hmm. and when you notice good in everything, when really bad things happen, 
and you do get a bruise to the ego, or you do get like feel flustered or whatever, you still see the silver lining. You can still always see the good in it. Like now, whenever bad things happen to me, I can usually right away see the good that's going to come after it. I love that. Yeah, rewiring of the brain is something I'm absolutely obsessed with as well because I, um, it, when you try it out and you're really bad at something, you do it again and like you, you're a little better and you do a little better and then eventually, you know, a year has passed and you're like, wow, like look how much progress I've done. I've clearly rewired my brain. So now I start going, what else can I do? And it's kind of like a, a game, going back to how much I love games. It's like, what else can I do and how much can I shorten that period of time? So if it is, you know, emotional sadness, for instance, I used to spend like three days in like sad music and things yeah. like that. And now it's like, I give myself 30 minutes and yep. you know over the period of my life going from days and days of just being wasted in misery to now I can condense it to 30 minutes um it's yeah it's the fun rewiring of the brain I love that I could talk to you for hours guys you've done so much Thank incredible you. things um where can people can find you online and where can they find um your new show Ooh, and all so the incredible things you're doing Wow, okay. So you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Noor, which is just N-O-O-R. And then Twitter and YouTube is N-T-A-G-O-U-R-I, which is my Tagori, so N-Tagori. And the documentary, Sold in America, is on Hulu and my Facebook. And the podcast is wherever you listen. It's so amazing, yeah. by the way. Like, groundbreaking stuff. Thank you. Really, really. And it is quite a heavy podcast. So I also did a podcast recently with Girl Boss called In Progress, An Imperfect Journey Navigated. So it's like 10 episodes on helping you build your journey and like taking the plunge. So if Sold in America gets too heavy, go listen to that one. Um, all right. And my last question, what do you consider your superpower to be? Ooh, my superpower. Um, just staying curious and on my toes with questions. Like, it was like the one thing growing up as a kid that I knew I was good at. I, it was like something that was so natural in me that just like came out. And every single teacher and professor and mentor I had was like, wow, you ask really good questions. And I was like, hey, questions get you places. And so the courage to ask the question and the curiosity to form the question is my superpower. I love it. All right, guys, you've got to go check out this woman's stuff. Everything she's doing is so mind-blowing. Literally, I didn't even want to like go to sleep last night because I was so entrenched in all of her incredible content. When you actually see the life that she has led, what she has personally had to go through, and then the knock-on effect that she's now having on other people, it's so incredible. With affecting the, you know, um, the trafficking industry and really making a dent there and bringing awareness to it, it's so incredible. But that all stems from her own experience and her own experience in having to fight through hard times. So go check her stuff out. It is so empowering and hopefully it will affect you guys just as much as it did me where now I'm going to actually act and I'm not going to accept naysayers. I'm not going to accept society telling me something that shouldn't be done because like her as a perfect example, it can actually lead you to great places. So don't listen to people. Go out and be the hero of your own life because the only person that's actually going to do that is you. All right, guys, if you're not already subscribed here, please click that subscribe button. And if you're not following me on social, it's at Lisa Billu. And until next time, guys, again, go be the superhero of your own life. Peace out. What up, guys? Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.